the month of Teves is the coldest month of the year, it is also the time when the night is longest and the day is shortest. Now part of the theme of these talks, monthly talks, is that the moon is not there to chase away the darkness of the night, but rather to reveal, to show us the beauty of the night, the beauty of darkness. And of course darkness doesn't mean evil or negative things. Darkness means those things that are private, personal, the things that thrive in secret, away from the cold, unfeeling light. There's a reason that intimacy takes place at night. Not only because you're off from work and you have free time, but because intimacy thrives in privacy, in the shade, where the sun doesn't shine, where the revelation is not glaring, but subtle. So the moon brings a subtle light to illuminate the beauty of the darkness, the, the value of the darkness, the, the power of things that are unsaid, unspoken, unrevealed. And of course that applies to many things. Like for example, Gullus versus Gula. The time of Gullus is a time of darkness. Uh, what's going to happen when the Geula happens, when Mashiach comes? There won't be a night, because the, the moon will be as bright as the sun. And then Hasidah says, we will be nostalgic, we will yearn for the days of Golos, because of the beauty that darkness contains. Also, there are parts of Torah that are not revealed. There's the revealed part of Torah and there's the hidden part of Torah. The hidden part of Torah is not something you shouldn't know. It's not meant to be, uh, to be denied or withheld. It's the secret part of Torah. And the secret part of Torah you learn by the light of the moon, not by the light of the sun. In other words, with a different approach, with a different sensitivity. So, if the nights are longer and the days are shorter, on the one hand, that's painful, because uh, <laughs> we're missing vitamin D. But there's a beauty to that as well. When the nights are longer, we need to appreciate more the beauty of the darkness because there's more of it. So in these months, we develop more than the other months the appreciation and the sensitivity for those things that are, that are not spoken, that are not revealed, that are not out in the open. So if Teves is the coldest month and the longest nights, Shvat follows and uh, takes it from the darkness to the month of Geula, to the celebration of Adar, which leads us to the Geula of Nisan. So we spoke last month about the humility of Teves. If Teves is the attribute of Netzach, Netzach is the humility that people have that enables them to accept fact, to respond to fact, even if personally, subjectively, I'm not in the mood, I don't understand, I don't appreciate, and I don't need. But what's right is right, I can do that. So an objectivity, to be able to respond to an objective need, takes a certain degree of humility. If uh, you have to go to war, nobody wants to, nobody likes it, Nobody even believes in it, but you got to do what you got to do. So if that's what the, what the situation calls for, you go. You do what you got to do. That's a, that's a great humility. 
even before we understand the purpose of a mitzvah. If that's the mitzvah, if that's the Jewish thing to do, you go for it. There's one short failing, shortcoming and failing in Netzach, and that is that I'm ready to do what must be done, but if I should find out that I'm doing what needs to be done, and you're not, you're sitting home having fun, this I can't tolerate. Because if I'm going to go to war, you got to go also. I'm not going to go off and risk my life while you're sitting enjoying your freedom. So Netzach kind of demands of others to have the same devotion to what's right. If right is right, why am I the only one doing it? The next attribute, Haid, Haidoa, is also humility, but a greater degree of humility, and that is, I, I'm comfortable, I understand that I need to go do what needs to be done, but you shouldn't. You, you deserve better, you deserve more. So you stay home and be safe, I'll go to war and protect you. That's a much greater humility. Being able to put fact above personal feeling is one thing. Being able to put another person before myself, that takes a much deeper kind of humility. And that's what Shvat, the month of Shvat, is all about. The month of Shvat doesn't have any holidays, just like Teves. Or it didn't until uh, very recently. The word Shvat, like the word Shevet, means a stick, a staff. And there are two words that we use to describe tribes, the tribes of Israel. The word Shevet and the word Mate. They both mean tribe. And yet they're very different, or even opposites. Mate means bendable, flexible. Shevet means inflexible. Shevet means a devotion that does not bend. Netzach has its, its weakness. It flexes. I will do what needs to be done if everybody does. If you do it too. I'm not going to do it by myself. Shvat, which is Hod, doesn't have that flexibility. I will do what needs to be done under all circumstances because it's fine with me that you stay home and be safe. I'll go protect you. I'll do the work for you. I will serve you, not just the fact. What happened in Shvat in recent years is, of course, the uh, transition of the previous Rebbe to the Rebbe. The sun set and the sun rose. And the ability to make the transition, to go from a complete and total devotion to the previous Rebbe and shift that devotion to the Rebbe, there's a great humility in that a profound humility in that. Because the devotion to the previous Rebbe was so emotional, it was so personal, it was so chesed, gvura, teferis, it had all the drama, all the deep feelings, all the emotions that kept people alive through the most difficult years in Russia. Well, it kept them spiritually alive. And to take all of that and give it to someone you are not familiar with, to a new Rebbe, and a Rebbe that seemed so radically different, with such a different agenda, with such a different approach, such a different style, that takes a great degree of humility. That's the month of Shvat. So, the uh, inflexibility, 
the shavit, the staff, uh, also has a, a hints at authority. The staff is the symbol of authority. Moshe used the staff as a symbol of authority, even though that was called mate, because his authority was a was a soft one, was a benign dictatorship. But he was the unquestioned leader, only he was sympathetic. So what, what does this mean in practical terms? In educating children, or even in our ed educating ourselves, there's a time for flexibility and there's a time for inflexibility. Inflexibility does not mean cruelty, it doesn't mean harshness, and it doesn't mean unfeeling. Inflexibility means there's, there's certain things that are absolutely true. There's room for uncertainty, but there's a need for certainty as well. When something is certain, then it is inflexible. In raising children, you don't have to be harsh but you have to be inflexible. Right is right. It's always right. You don't change your mind. You don't make exceptions. When it comes to right and wrong, there has to be a certain firmness, a, no, a, a, a non-yielding. Because if you yield, then you've undone all your chinuch, all your education. So, for example, you tell a child not to eat candy before a meal because you don't want him to ruin his appetite. You can be flexible with that. That's not a halacha, you know, written in stone. Not putting his shoes on the couch. Uh, <laughs> not climbing up the, uh, the curtains or the drapes. Not swinging from the chandelier. These are all important things, but you can be a little flexible in that. It's not a halacha. It's not divine. But when you teach a halacha not kosher, there's no flexibility there. Not that you punish, not that you scream, not that you're harsh, but there's no give. So that when you tell a child, this is not kosher and we don't eat it, it, it sounds inflexible, it sounds permanent, it sounds real, and the children will not challenge that. <clears throat> From our our own experience, we tell children not to eat certain candy because it's for later, it's not for you, it's, it's, it's for the party, uh, it'll ruin your teeth. All the good excuses, if we leave the candy in the kitchen anywhere, by the next day it will be gone. But if we tell children these candies are not kosher, they can sit there months, no one will touch it. And it's not like they're even tempted. Not kosher, then it's off the chart. Then it's, then, it, then it's out of the question. So there's a certain inflexibility that is appropriate for things that are absolutely true. And if you compromise, if it doesn't come across that inflexible, you're, you're not teaching the truth. So there's a story of the Fidi Kerebbe, when he was a very young boy, was eating breakfast, his mother was giving him breakfast, and his father came in and said, have you said brachas? Not the bracha on the food, the morning brachas. And he started to cry. So his father said to him, how could you eat before brachas? And his mother said, uh, he was hungry, and he's an only child, so he ate. So he had something to eat. His father wouldn't hear of it. How could you? So he started. He started to tremble. And his mother said to the to his father, to the Rebbe Rashab, "Look, you're you're scared. You're he's he's shaking." And his father said, when you eat before brachas, you should shake, you should tremble. So the mother said, 
He's just a young boy. He was very young. He was a very young child. He's just a, he's just a child. And the Rebbe said, a child very soon becomes an adult. And an adult realizes what a child he is. <laughs> so, so the distance and the difference between a child and an adult is very small. It's not, it's not an excuse. The Rebbe then writes in his diary that he is so grateful and so thankful to his father for such a great chinuch. What was the greatness of the chinuch? Inflexible. It wasn't harsh, but, but there was no wiggle room. This is wrong, it's wrong, and if it's right, it's right. And that actually makes children appreciate the mitzvah and gives them an chayas, an enthusiasm for the mitzvah. When you teach mitzvahs with flexibility, it's not so exciting. It doesn't have that energy. And so children get lax because it was kind of introduced with a laxity. So shvat means let's get our act together Let's not make compromises, and let's make the transition. Yudshvat was a transition. Let's go from the coldness to the beginning of warmth. Let's go from the objective, cold fact of the mitzvah to the enthusiasm and the enjoyment of the mitzvah. And that leads us into Adar.